here. We are now live, I want to say, fellas. Yes, we are live. All right, all right, all right. What up, what up, what up, what up, what up, everybody out on Facebook land, out in the internet world. Um, I know we're live on several streaming platforms right now. So um, my name is Chef Chad Cherry, and I want to introduce and welcome you to another episode of The Bridge. This is Barbershop Talk, a uh, uh, black man, we say King Talk over here. Um, but tonight we also have uh, a special guest. We have a lovely lady, uh, one of our black queens to help us out. Um, so with that being said, our topic for tonight is the worst cities to be black in America, especially after seeing what just happened to, to Mr. Blake um, in Kenosha and then the, the ensuing riots and what happened to more people as they lost their lives there. Um, we're also going to talk about police reform. Right. What does it mean? Why is it necessary? How does it really look? You know, just flush out a lot of things. Um, we've heard the, the words defund the police several times, but we got to dive into that. What does that really mean? So to do that, I'm going to introduce our, our people. I'm going to start with our guest. Uh, first, we have uh, lovely Miss Brenda Morrison. Shout out to her. She is the president of the Urban League uh, Young Professional Network in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Known her for several years. She's an awesome, awesome, awesome lady. Very knowledgeable, very hardworking. Um, and then we have Mr. Aubrey. Aubrey, what's good? My brother, Aubrey Moultrie. He is um, previous, in his previous life, he was a uh, he worked in law enforcement um, in the in the Tri County in South Florida, the Tri County area. I'm not going to shout out the thing. If he wants to shout out where, then I'll let him do that. But he's here to offer that perspective because, as always, if we're going to have a conversation, we should have the people who you know have experienced it. And um, we have our regulars. We got Mr. J, who's our host, right? Uh, Mr. James, he's over there getting you right. We have Chef Irie who is our, our resident wisdom. He always gives us that sagely advice. And we have Mr. Moneywise himself, Rashad Henderson, who's in the building, um, who's going to chop it up. He's going to bring them random facts. As always, the stuff that we talk about, some of it is amazing. Some of it is super intellectual. And some of it is just nonsense. It is totally up to you to decide. Do your own research. Listen to us. Work with us. This is The Bridge. Let's kick it off, family. All right. So, first time. Where, where are we going to start? We're we going to start, yeah. And by the way, guests, this is real. We get real informal in here, right? Like, you, did, barbershop talk means you got to jump in there, okay, and search yourself. There will be times when I'll be like, hey, let the guests speak. Um, <laughs> but y'all got to jump in. And I think, we, I think we tackle, because I think police reform will flow naturally from the first conversation. I think we tackle, uh, you know, being black, living in cities in America, some of the worst cities to live in. I think we tackled that first um, because I think everything else will flow from there. You guys good with that? Okay, okay. So I don't know. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it out with this. I remember seeing, you know, articles a while ago, like when we were thinking about moving, about where where, where it was great for black families to relocate, and then. Um, I also remember stories in Fort Lauderdale specifically about sundown laws. And it's funny because there's a new book coming out. I've seen a few articles about that recently. And um, if we don't know what sundown laws are, those are basically saying, hey, if you're black, don't be here after dark. Right. And those were common in thousands of cities across America. There are thousands of cities that were just pure white um, by design. And yeah. so, you know, in thinking about this, guys, um, and 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 gals, my bad. You know, <laughs> I'm getting right. Um, I guess the question is, and I, I'm I'm gonna start it out with a straight question. Then y'all take it whatever direction I want to. I guess my question for for everybody here is this, right? I have seen places where I knew there were no black people, and black people were moving in. Why? Why do we want? Should we even want to live in places where they don't want us? Should we, I mean, like, should we be building our own towns and cities? Like, where, where are we at, guys? Like, and then we can start naming off some of these places. But I'm just starting out there with, yeah, they well, don't want why, why are we going there? Well, I think that we should have the options to do both. And I think okay. that at the end of the day, that's what it is. I have been a proponent of saying everywhere there's white people, 
I want to be there. Just to show them that we're everywhere that you are and we can do exactly what you guys are doing and better. So <laughs> if it's something like, for example, I was the second black mounted officer to join the department or the second black officer to join the mounted squad on the department. I didn't know anything about riding horses. I didn't know nothing at all, but I knew that <laughs> we needed somebody there as representation. Okay. So I think we should have the option. I think at the end of the day, that's what it is. We should be able to live where we want to live and not be harassed because we did. So it's not our problem, it's their problem. That's, so that's a matter, I, of, matter of perspective. Yeah, that's the perspective there. That's a, yeah, that's, I mean, that's 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 like, like yo, that's they that's they in their personal feeling, you know. I um, me, I take it, uh, I take I take it from a stand of uh, just look, we 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 in it together, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's 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 the we got we got amendments specifically, uh, because of the the that black folks have, have gone through. So, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. I got the right to to the pursuit of property, liberty, and happiness. No matter where else, where wherever I, I want to pursue that, we should be able to pursue that. It's, that's that's it. That's what it is. Yeah. Brenda, what do you feel? So I feel uh, I feel kind of like Aubrey's perspective, where I feel like you should have representation where a white person is. Um, it's not their land, it's not our land, it's everybody's land. And I feel like we should be able to at least uh, see where, what, what suits a family best fit in terms of making moves. If you're a black person, you should be able to do it. That's in a unicorn life of a world, but that ain't where we at right now. But you know, uh, universally, I feel like we should be able to go anywhere that we wanna go. Anywhere where white people are, we should be able to go there as well. Facts. I mean, roll through with the hey neighbor and all of that and not give a damn how they feel about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, nah, nah, I mean, that, that's a fact. I mean, I guess the, why I asked that question is just being more introspective now. It's because, you know, Black America, we in a place now where we, yeah, we can, but we don't literally, literally, we don't have to. Right, we don't have to assimilate at all anymore, anywhere in any spaces. And a lot of times, you know, um, like you said, Brother Aubrey, it was about us taking power and making sure there was representation, right? Um, and I'm just wondering if we're not at a different shift, right? In, in in our in our societal path, in our cultural path, right? A shift that that where we're like, hey, look you can either have representation or we can just go about our business and do our total own separate thing because we have the resources, the education, the dollars, the connections, right? <laughs> we ain't got to do shit with y'all anymore that we don't really want to. And when we want to, if you don't let us in, then you lose all of us, you know what I'm saying? So this, this is, that was the spirit that I was asking that question in because we come to my man, my man, Mr. Blake, um, who unfortunately got shot in Kenosha and, and him getting shot, we can argue a lot of different things about whether he was right and not obeying quote unquote, a lawful command or whatever. But if that was just a one-off incident, you know, then it would be like, oh, well, then maybe he should have, he could have, you know, this, that, and the third, right? But first of all, that wasn't a one-off incident. And then immediately after, you have this young terrorist, Kyle Rittenhouse. Call him what he is. Right? Young terrorist. No, there, there's, no, there's no such thing as domestic terrorism. There's no. Oh, shit. <laughs> bullshit. Aubrey will tell you. Aubrey will tell you. Man. No, Aubrey will dude... tell you. This dude walked I, I'm street. just I'm I'm, I, I'm well, not I'm not arguing with you. I'm just stating the, I'm just stating the fact. True. It's yo. It's I'm just, it is. I'm just stating, I'm not arguing. Under, I'm not. Under, I'm, under, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just stating a fact. Under the current orange commander in chief, you're right. He ain't gonna say he ain't not, gonna say that. But it's not. It's that's not, 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 no. No. Hold on now. Let's not, say it's this. Not the orange commander in chief. It, but let's say this. If 
if he's not a terrorist, then why and no, no, um, what did you say? Um, uh, it was, um, Rashad, that he's not a terrorist because of what I said, there is no such thing as domestic terrorism. Okay, now mm-hmm. if if there can't be a domestic terrorist, then why would you want to label Black Lives Matter a terrorist yep. group? Come on, a terrorist organization. Come on. Facts. Man. It'll, There's no such it'll. thing as the, I'm I'm the, I'm not arguing with you. What I'm saying is there's no such thing as domestic terrorism. I, I agree with you. So black I mean, lives matter can't so be a, a, a terrorist. The question is the question is if there's no such thing as domestic terrorism, how can black lives matter be led a terrorist organization? Have they been? They have been, and that's why I'm like you can't lie to me, Craig. You can't. T- Listen. Have they? Well, no. Have they haven't. They, they haven't. Have they but, been labeled a terrorist organization? Well, they haven't been. So, so has who has been labeled a terrorist organization? Well, Saturday, well, this, this, this is what right? I was, this is what I was saying. They, they haven't, but the way Trump speaks, because he calls them a terrorist, right? Exactly. They exactly. are labeled a terrorist group, right? So we, we know who? words have power by the and president, by the yeah, president. By the president. No. Now, now this is the so this 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 um because the a lot of this goes into nuance, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And us, us, and this is where where we uh, we sometimes we can get bogged down. We got to know what we talk about because words are power, right? And using the wrong words can easily shift power to uh, or or create leverage for different groups of people. And we have to because we, we it's the law. Saying it because I sell insurance, and one of the things was insuring terrorism. So okay. there is no domestic I'm terrorism. You the side eye. I'm, I'm gonna need you to come to a good point. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you. I'm not. I'm not. I, I know you feel <laughs> plays out how, how how it plays out. All of that's good, but you got you got to look at how the other how the other group is going to look at it, right? I have a question. Looks at it. Yeah, j- jump in there. Chef. It makes a difference. Yeah, go, this, I'm going just a little bit back to the earlier conversation about where we should live, want to live, you know, can right. live. So, yeah. if we're moving out to the burbs, mm-hmm. from the burbs, mm-hmm. are we doing that according to as Aubrey says to show that? show them that we can do it or are we doing it to as they would say style on our on the people that look like us saying that we can do it hey hey because I mean, you know you're not you know everybody's like yeah you know i'm out of I'm, I'm at the burbs now and everybody that you know seem like they moved to the burbs because they can seemingly forget where they came from and the burbs <laughs> is now the place to be and you're not like me so i can't really affiliate with you now because i'm in the burbs and i'm I'm with people that are now quote unquote successful Mm. so are we doing it for them or are we just styling on our own people yeah Yeah. create create a question a separation and i think that that's what i I, I was going to eventually come around to but that simple that sense of separation, you know, not necessarily physically, but that could be detrimental to the, the whole cause of, hey, if you don't do this, then you're going to us all. You see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So that so, it, you know, we have to we have to be aware of what we're doing, how we're doing it. How we're doing it. It's a, it's a lot more. So, you know, I mean, you, but I, I ask it because, you know, and, you know, every time we have, you know, for the guests that are on, um, we always seem to have a conversation that references, you know, maybe six shows ago, you know, because there's always a common, a commonality and a thread that, that is, you know, provide, you know, through all, for every Zoom that we have. And, you know, the whole thing about, um, Damn, what was I about to say? You <laughs> <laughs> oh, was on the roll, You had us all on the edge of the seat. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, man. I was listening. <laughs> There's a common thread in, in all of our conversations. We're going to sum it up. There we go. We, but it's, 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 Damn. It's, that is crazy. It's, it's, I guess that's called it out. You know, one of those fart moments. Jeez, you know, <laughs> fart moments. But yeah, it, 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 it's just, a, you know, it does seem like a pertinent question, um, mm -hmm. you know, pertinent question to ask. No, nah, it is it is a pertinent question because even going back to the original topic, y'all, I think while we may disagree on on the whys and if we should or could or all of that stuff, um, Detroit, Mr. Peoples, yes, sir. Um, I, I wanna, I, I think, I think it's this, right? Um, we could literally list some of the worst places in America to live. But it's almost a moot point because I've traveled this country in every state. I grew up in the North. And I live in the South. In almost every state I've been to, there's always been those places where you get those early warnings. Like, hey, look, you might not want to slide over there too tough if your skin color ain't light. Yeah. You know, right. and um, raise up, raise up out of here. Raise up. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the thing is, so then it makes that question of the worst places for black people to live like, um it makes it a very interesting question. Like I'm out in central Florida right now and literally I'm, I'm East Orlando and the town next door, they was already like, well, listen, right. When you come out of here, just turn right. Don't even turn left. Don't stop at the grocery stores over there. Don't go. No, I'm serious. I, I'm dead. My white neighbor whose husband is a police officer next door with a, with a dog named Draco. So look, right. They, they're not coming for Draco. I said, oh, ain't this some shit? I said, why do I get this neighbor? Right? <laughs> ain't this some shit? Um, she told me, yeah, 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 that ain't really, that ain't really what's popping if you, if you black. Let, let my, I want to hear Audrey's point of view. Uh, how, 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 how you feel about that, Audrey? <laughs> about what? The, well, listen, no, no, no. here's, here's the thing. Um, I went to college in Orlando. I went to, I went to the University of Central Florida. So, Are you with the UCF? I'm yes, over there. I am you know what? Yeah, okay. So you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and I used to live in Claremont. <laughs> okay. Be, before there was any black people out there. Mm. <laughs> and literally, and, and again, this because we talked about this, um, I was living in Claremont um, Barack Obama's first term. I had the only Barack Obama sign in my yard. Everyone else in the development was white Republican. So oh yeah, them Trump signs fly heavy over here. Listen, <laughs> I, I tell people all the time, don't confuse Miami with the rest of Florida. No. Because the rest of Florida is as Republican and as racist as you can possibly get. Facts. Listen, we in the deep, deep, deep South. Wee, wee. Yeah, that's I don't even think the people in 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 North Florida consider themselves to be in the South. You know, you know, they just figure they just in another part of the country. I don't think they see that mm -hmm. in the South. They don't operate like they in the South. Oh they no 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 like no! Them. Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! They believe that's <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> not not from the, not from the from a historical or racial or they just operate. Like this is not the South. This is just a whole territory unto itself. We do whatever we want to do down here. Yes, the, the a lot of things that happen here are very reflective of what um, happens in the South as we know yeah. it. But I don't think the people meant in, in, in from a mental perspective consider themselves Southerners. You know, well, not, not that's so much like, that's Maybe saying, I don't we know. don't want to tear down these Confederate statues. No, no, I, that, that's I, our history. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna take this right, because I think when you go to those certain cities, like uh, my mom lives in Coolston, Florida, uh, mm -hmm. which is right outside of Belle Glaze, Naples, and Sebring. Mm -hmm. And let me mm -hmm. tell you right now, those are they're very racist in Sebring, Coolston, and this is only an hour and a half outside of Miami. And the right. same thing, mm -hmm. you know, there's a city in Miami called Christmas, Florida, which is yep. probably about yes. 25 minutes outside of Orlando. Yep. Again, very racist mm -hmm. and very mm -hmm. blatant with it, mm -hmm. you know, and they consider themselves Southerners. I think it's only when you get to the Fort Lauderdale area where you question whether or not you're in the South. But I think anything <laughs> north of Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> it's blatant. 
Even let's be honest. Even in West Palm Beach, Beach Florida, Florida, Florida. listen, mm-hmm. South Florida is Latin America. Okay. <laughs> It is not even the Caribbean, United States. Caribbean, Caribbean, and, Caribbean, Latin America. We you know what I'm saying we got some Car- Caribbean. Caribbean too, Latin. Too. Caribbean Latin. Like, 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 don't do that. I don't do Irie like that. Don't no, do that. man. Yo, yo, it is, yo, in the words of our esteemed leader, it is what it is. But, <laughs> well, I, I, I still want to address what Irie was saying though about yeah, go, ahead. go ahead, get it, Jay. Because uh, I just came back this weekend mm-hmm. <laughs> and the confederate flag was flying nice and high and high <laughs> yo high. But see, I'm, not saying, by the I'm, not, I'm not i have I never been called niggas said, so much i'm in not my trying life. to discount the the, the 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 you know the southern ideas and principles that people still live with you know um you know it's just you know just my opinion um you know, Florida just seems like a just it just seems like a, a a state that operates in in ways that's just just totally different than than everywhere else. Even you know, it operates different from Georgia. You know, yes, I lived in in North Florida. You know, mm-hmm. I went to school. I went to school in North Florida. I lived so, in Jacksonville. Went to school in Gainesville. You know, I didn't. Ne- I never wanted to drive down to Ocala ever. You know, what uh, <laughs> in Ocala? Nope. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, okay. so, so, yeah, Gainesville's as confederate as they come in North Florida. You know, exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. the, the, the semester that I was supposed to, to go to to start school in 99, you know, 90 this summer, they had, you know, racial uprising on campus. You know, mm-hmm. there was beating, beating people left and right on, on campus. And there was, you know, there was stuff that was happening. All well, you, you was living through higher learning. You remember the movie? Yeah, yeah, I, remember, yeah, I yeah, love yeah, you, yeah. Daisy, in the background. I love you, Daisy. Yeah, most definitely. Yo, you know, so, so you look at it. You know, I, I left Jamaica, went to New York, and then went to went to Jacksonville. You know, oh, wow. So that's, imagine, that's a imagine shot. my yeah. my um, yeah, imagine what the, the 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 thing that I had to go through when you you know immediately you go you land in Jacksonville. My immediate thought was, damn. That shit is Why, Lord? Why? Yes. Lord. Like, you know? And that? I was like, man, I thought Jamaica was, you know. Duval yeah, County. That, but. <laughs> you know, Jamaica, look, when you start comparing parts of America to Jamaica, bro, you know. <laughs> it's, it's bad. It's that bad. Yeah. And then, you know, so then you start to learn and understand, you know, because Jacksonville is basically, you know, in, in four or five sections, you know, east side, west side, mm-hmm. north side, south side. Uh, south yeah. side. And north side is our people, east side is bougie, you know, south side is kind of a mix, and west side is what it is, you know. And when you I just remember I was working for Sharon Williams and I got I got lost, you know, making the delivery on West Side. And that Did was you tell him you was lost? <laughs> wait a minute. I gotta figure out how to get back. <laughs> you know, and you like you said, you you see the flags. You've seen this and you've seen everything and you mm. know and i'm seeing you know pickup trucks with you know loaded <laughs> gun racks and everything and yeah. i'm just like damn how the hell do i get off 275. <laughs> hey, I, got a question, I, I got a question for you irie once you hit um jacksonville how soon was you called a boy mm. uh, we talked about this so the first so the not a boy but the first time that i was ever called a nigga was in jacksonville and this was maybe my probably my second year because I'd started junior college and I was at the bus stop um, on the south side, on the south side, waiting for the bus and a convertible, a Chevy convertible passed by about four or five guys and all white guys. And the guys was like, yo, nigga. I, is, I was by myself at the bus stop, and I'm just like, who the hell are they talking to? And they and was they talking that hard, hey, they nigga. They did this thing where you turn around. No, 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 it was the ER. You turn around, and you look around, you're like, fool, it's <laughs> you. You're the only one that's out here. And yeah. I'm like, the first thought was, damn, can that bus come quick enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, mean, know, so, I had that, never been that really alarmed, you know, That really alarmed me, you know, because... You know, that's when I think I started to, to really take notice and pay attention, not just to my surroundings, but to start to understand 
my relationship with you know um, African Americans and people that were born and live here, you know, um, because that was sort of like the 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 gunshot that went off. Mm. You know, you so, like, ooh, open your eyes, open yeah. your ears now. Wait, 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 Rashad, hold on. Because I got to get this out because as Ari says that, it, it brings up a good point, and I got to kick it over to Brenda and Aubrey too. Um, mm. It is a different thing living in Florida than it would be living in certain parts of Georgia outside of Atlanta, right? Or going to Mississippi huh. or Tennessee, mm-hmm. right? Or mm-hmm. even Kakalaki. South Carolina, to Kakalaki, South mm-hmm. Carolina, North Carolina. I'm mm-hmm. telling you, Virginia, West, West Virginia. It's West Virginia, different... West Virginia. Yep, <laughs> West Virginia. We're off of 95 or 64. <laughs> <laughs> bro, bro, and, and and you know, and so why I'm gonna kick this out to, to Brenda and Aubrey is um, you know, Ari's Caribbean, so like you said, he he had to come to terms with his blackness, right? Um, and his connection, not his blackness, but his connection to black people in America. Um, I don't know if if either of you are Caribbean, but I think that that is uh I think we all had that coming to terms moment. And um, you know what I'm saying? I, I think I always that do. <laughs> <laughs> well, bro, I mean, I, I'm going to be good. Sit. I'm going to be nice. Go, I'm going to be good. Yeah, go ahead. Yo, yeah, yeah, yo. You know, but just like you're saying, Chad, you know, a lot, a, lot of us come, yeah, a lot of us come from the islands. You know, we yeah. have different sensibilities, whether it's race, colorism, mm-hmm. you know, all of that stuff, you know, but to actually deal with the, not the principle and the idea and context of racism um, and, you know, indiscriminate racism, um, that's not what most of us went through, you know? And so to un- when, you, when you get thrown in it, and a lot of us are probably still trying to deny the fact that because we are from other places, it doesn't affect you, you know? So a lot of those people sometimes don't say, they don't speak up or they speak up at a different level because they're looking for other people <laughs> to defend and protect them. So that's why probably most of them don't vote you know, mm, uh, because mm. they're looking for other people to, to, to be their voice and not, and, you know, because they're still in denial, you know, that no, you know, racism doesn't affect me. I'm like, well, yeah, until you get pulled over or, or some, some other stuff, so you, get, you, get, you know? And, yeah, and that's why I wanted to kick it back to Brendan and Aubrey, because I didn't know, I mean, Aubrey, brother, you know, you did something that not many of us ever do, ever aspire to do, so kudos to that, man. Yes. Um, and Brenda, you know, I don't know your background fully, so I'd love to hear you guys take on what we're talking about. You know, yeah. we're talking about places, but yeah, jump in there, y'all, because because your voices are necessary in yeah. this moment. So I actually was born in Jamaica. Um, I came yeah, here. Yeah. I came here. Yep, <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I came here 2001. Um, I have an older brother. Um, and so um, from when I was in Jamaica, the thing that I experienced or I noticed, I don't think I have heavily experienced it, but I definitely noticed it um, was the colorism. So I'm notably lighter than my brother. My brother's dark skin, I'm more on on the uh, lighter side. And so my grandmother um, was one of those who liked the brown skin, always talking about brown skin. And so she, you know, one of her kids, her grandkids to have the brown skin. So when it came to like my uncle, one of my uncles being of a darker skin, it always launched into those type of conversations and a colorism conversation. Um, That's what I remember uh, heavily from when I was in Jamaica. When I came here, um, when I noticed it the first time is when like one of my brothers had his friends come over to our house and they didn't know at the time, like I was just peeking through and just listening in, but like, one of his friends like act, literally acts like, yo, is your sister adopted? Cause I look that much different in terms of the skin color than my brother. Um, Damn. And, yeah, that was wild. That was absolutely but wild. Because, Cause I mean, like, even though like our, 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 our skin colors are, are, you could definitely see the difference, but there's like some genetic features that you're like, for sure, y'all are definitely related by blood. And so, mm. like, hearing that for the first time, I was like, yo, like, this really how people feel? Like, that that blew my mind. 
Um, but the great thing is like, even at that time, my brother and I were very cognizant to not let the, 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 the shade of the skin color like define us, like the love was through and through. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely experienced the colorism. Definitely experienced that. I didn't, I don't, I'm very much aware of the racism nonetheless. I've, I felt it more when it comes to me now being in different boardrooms and I'm like one of the two black people that's in there compared to white Facts. people. And so like now when it comes to kind of getting your feedback or your thoughts about, you know, how do, how, do, how do I help? Or like, how do we move the needle forward? You know, that whole type of thing now and getting my feedback, that, that that's exhausting. It gets to a point where it gets exhausting. You try to be very, uh, uh, you try to be strategic in what you could possibly get out of them, you know, to benefit the people that you serve. But then it gets just super exhausting because I'm like, how do you not know this stuff don't happen? You know, mm -hmm. I've been finding myself like uh, reading a book uh, that uh, Winnie M. Young wrote. He's actually one of the past executive directors for the National Urban League. Um, and he was actually one of the big six that- um, Did you say Whitney Young? Yeah. yeah. That's fan right there. Yeah. Fan favorite, it wouldn't, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know yeah. about it. He put on, he was one of the big six who put on a march on Washington and um, before he passed away in 71, um, he put he put out two books. One book was called Beyond Racism and the other one was called To Be Equal. And so I've been reading the, the the Beyond Racism one and it's wild to me, like some of the same experiences that he's detailing in the book is some of the same experiences that today is considered brave to talk in like uh, uh, corporate America spaces when it's like, yo, we've been dealing with this for so long. And so that's why I was asking the question, like, does, do we have to even like everywhere we go, we're dealing with this, anywhere in the country. Because even if we go to a progressive city, quote unquote, yeah. right? Yeah. Even if it's progressive, you're still dealing with what you said, like in the boardrooms, right? Yeah. When you get to this top of your career field, in any career, we're still dealing with it. So where is it actually good for Black people to be in America? Is, is you know, well, so... That's why I was asking that question earlier, and I don't. I want to give Aubrey a chance to respond as well. I mean, but you know, the thing is, like, yo, you know, like this shit is it's frustrating. It's, it's wild. Yeah. Well, um, frustrating is an understatement. Um, like I said, I went to University of Central Florida. Um, it wasn't uncommon to be in a classroom of three hundred people and there be two Blacks. Um, you know, I, I brought one of the um, only minority um, clubs to the, to the school because there wasn't any when I was there. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, I am of the mindset that if we're not there, I'm not gonna complain about us not being there until I put in the effort to get us there. And that's the mindset that I operate from. But it doesn't take away the frustrations. Um, it certainly makes you angry. Um, I feel like we're, com we're, we're always having conversations that we shouldn't have to have because like Brenda said, you know, she's reading a book where she's going through stuff that this man wrote years ago. You know, it's, you know everyone liked to talk about this great migration and this great change. You know, but it's not that far from where we started from, in my personal opinion. You know, because we're still, I mean, look at some of the songs, what's going on? Literally, what he's talking about in the song, what's going on, we're still dealing with it today. You know, I'm like, you know, so at what point do we ask ourselves, you know, how do we make him listen? Um, but it's interesting because I, I had shared, uh, I don't know if you got, I didn't share it with James, but I think I sent it to, to, to chat earlier. Um, but it was a, it was a black guy and, and I didn't look to see who the name of the cat that was speaking. And it was, it was off, um, DL Hughley's page today. And the cat was giving us, you know, a speech. And basically he was saying, you know, this happened, you know, nearly 40 years ago, the speech and, whatever he was everything that he was saying you know we're not going to take it we're not you know we got to stand up he was saying that 40 years ago and mm -hmm. it just seems like we're still 
token, we have the same talking points, the same ideals, but nobody still ain't listening. You know, and he's like, you know, if we ain't listening, if you know, nobody's listening, then you gotta have to do something that's more, I guess, aggressive, you know, for people to, li- to, to hear you. I mean, if your kid ain't listening, you know, yap, 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 yap all day, you know, as they were saying to make, if you can't hear, you're gonna feel. Yeah. Right. And I think, I, 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 go ahead, Brenda. Oh, go, go ahead, Rob. No, I'm good. Y'all can go ahead. Go and you know what? I think right now, I think that's the mindset of where we are right now. Um, you know, we have mixed opinions on looting um, when it comes down to the movement, you know, but I'm a firm believer that burn it down, burn it down to the ground. Uh, because if you ask me, for example, if you burn it down all of the Louis Vuittons, all of the Mercedes dealership, you know, Apple, Starbucks, you know, the people with the major influences in the neighborhood, you know, and you keep burning down their properties, you're affecting their money and their and their bottom line. At some point, they're going to go to the police officers and the people in their communities and say, listen, we need to talk to these people and come up with a point so they can stop burning down my stuff because we know they listen to money, finances. You know, that's 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 yeah. what this country yeah. is based on. So I think once you start attacking their pockets, because guess what? Nothing we're doing in the streets right now is affecting Bill Gates. He's living in a private neighborhood. He got all his security. He got his life is going on as normal. You know, but until you start affecting the things that gives make him money, now he's listening. Now he's paying attention to the looting and the rioting because it makes sense to him. Let me let me ask let me ask you this off as um uh, having having experienced law enforcement, how well long do you think that actually play out? Because that's we all we all we, we tend to go back and forth between our but we need to work political angles so on and then just burn it all down. Now if we if we swing well, let's go ahead and play this. So uh black folks Decide to burn it all down. How well you think that's really going to work out? Well, I think to answer your question, I think that is one of the elements of the movement. It is not the movement. You know, we still need to be able to hit them in, in government. You know, mm-hmm. we still need to be able to hit them. You know, we need to touch everybody because we're not doing this by ourselves. Facts. But again, we need Facts. to let them know that we mean business. Uh, when we say enough is enough this time, we were burning down until you talked about until you talked to us. Yep. And now you're just not mm-hmm. going to talk to us. Your actions are not going to match your words. So this is this is actually a perfect time to segue. And I knew it would happen in the conversation. And I know we didn't really get to listing all of the, the best places or the worst places for black people to live. So we may have to touch on that again later on in the conversation. But this is a great time to talk about police reform and Aubrey. You just brought up two amazing points. One, you started with finances. And then two, you said, we got to hit them where they feel it. And Brenda, you know, being that you're, you're, you're the head of our, our local Young Professionals Network, I know you deal a lot with corporate America and a lot with business. And we know business is about money. Um, police reform, right? How do our businesses, you know, black business, how do our black businesses jump into this conversation about police reform and make their presence felt and what they know? And, and what do you think is there is their responsibility if they have any? So maybe we start there. Do they have a responsibility, you know, to, 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 to use their influence? And if so, how do they do that? And Brenda, I want to pose that question to you to kick off this first topic. And then we're going to swing back around and we're going to jump into police reform with gusto because this is going to be a great convo from here. Yeah, so for sure, I definitely think that they do have a responsibility, and I feel like the responsibility goes way beyond making statements. Um, statements mm-hmm. was the cute thing to do, but now like, <laughs> Say people, it was cute thing. <laughs> people are looking for tangible stuff right now. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, we're not looking for your logo to be attached to stuff. Like, we're looking for tangible, tangible stuff. So I could even say, just even on my end, what I'm even doing in my position to advocate Uh, for my young professionals is that certain rooms that I'm in like white folks don't even understand like having people black people who are very knowledgeable very skilled 
have them be represented and be reflective on your board to have mm -hmm. give them that voice give them that space to lend their voice their talent their treasure um to it they don't even understand that you know and pushing them to get them to see way past the quota you know not it ain't about filling quotas at this point because you're going to continue to see yourself run into these situations and then you're at a table like what do we do but if you never believed in the black person who got the skill set who got the the, the 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 knowledge who has the experiences to say this is what i could do to lend to to to, uh, to kind of elevate the work that y'all are doing mm -hmm. within this board y'all gonna continue to have the same problems so from my standpoint i'm always advocating and i'm always telling folks who are white who have positions positions to where they are able to choose who sits on their board that you need to have it reflective of the people that you serve so even if that comes to um even if that comes to workers you got people talking about black people who are workers elevating them up to supervisor roles or even on a director role um when it comes to sitting on boards that have influence in the community, making sure that you got somebody who has experiences who can who can um, uh, kind of reciprocate that on a board level, um, and, and elevating young professionals who have the skill sets. Because even some of our folks, they don't even understand the reason of why they need to be on boards. They like, okay, okay what you telling me why I need to be on a board? I mean, you know, does, does that get me this place? That is, they don't even understand it. So I know from my standpoint, I'm always in a room trying to always tell people why you need to upskill people because it's always a thing of, you know, a thing that often is talked about in like corporate America is like having mentors, but also having sponsors. And sponsors are the people who could walk your name into a door to get you an upper level management position. And when it comes down to white folks, white folks don't got sponsors, like they just get their paper pushed through. You know, Gosh. and trying to make sure that, you know, even just other young professionals understand that it's been part of my, my duty and my role. And then I just quickly even want to just touch on um, the um, police reform thing as well, is that um, one thing that I could even talk about with, with talking with like even like the local uh, NAACP president um, is pushing to advocate for um, uh boards review boards but to push them to have subpoena power um to make sure that they they have the will and the power to not not only just review stuff and, and give their feedback on a case but actually subpoena people um to even get involved in, in saying was this right was this officer acting in the right way was he not um giving them a leverage of power not only just giving just uh, those investigatory um, um, boards outside of the people to be able to just have the power. And I think that's a unique tool that I think we should definitely look into. And last thing I just yeah. want to say, and I feel like we're going to touch on it again at some point, <laughs> but uh, we got to talk about police unions and the power and, and the legal standing that they have. Yeah. It's, 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 that, it's too much, too much. I'm glad you said that's what Thank I was thinking much. when I was talking Thank about much. our that's community. Much. Yeah, no, no, way too are much. Good, though. You, you, what? Unions are no, no. common people. Police unions, though? Police <laughs> unions are a little, they're a little ridiculous, you, dude. Really? Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. But aren't unions the, unions? No, 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 nah. no, no. Nah. You know I, say, I say it like this. I say it like this. Like I get from a historical standpoint what unions were there for. It was, it was, it was a way to show workers how they could organize. But right is right and wrong is wrong. It ain't the union's thing to go sit here and go protect wrong because you advocating for your worker. Right is right, wrong is wrong. That's what that's that's where I'm at. And, that's, and, and that's also, yeah, um, um, also, um, what people don't, most people don't hear about unions are black folks weren't included in those whole union rights being from from the from the outset. That that was a, a very late. Uh, a very process, and actually, um, Whitney Young mm -hmm. and uh, Martin Luther—they they, they actually talked a lot, talked a lot about that. Is we all we always get we uh, as black folks, we tend to catch the left from yep. from the because, yes. But see, well, I, I can tell you, I, I can, can tell you, even the though the that part. black people are now included, especially as a police officer in these unions, I can tell you that even. The black people don't get the same representation mm -hmm. in those unions mm -hmm. as the white people. When I'm specifically mm -hmm. talking about police officers, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That is that is due, and we need to talk about that because if we're talking about police reform, I think people the the catch, first of all, I hate that catchphrase defund the police because it's it's very misleading. Right. Right. Um, but if we're talking about police reform, yo, Brenda just gave us wisdom. Yo, we need citizen review boards with subpoena power. Yep. Exactly. Right. That's exactly. that's that's mandatory. Key word there is citizen review boards that are diverse and that have multiple people. And yep. we need to like flat out uh, police unions need to be dismantled. They need to be thought over again. They need to be dismantled and thought over again. Um, you just know, and seeing it, just seeing it even within the bar, the bar of sheriff's race. I mean, oh. the, like the 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 the. the, the amount of counter misinformation I had to do and a lot of my members had to do because they're like oh what does this mean if they get 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 endorsed by this union and this union what does that mean it's a whole bunch of misinformation and they like well you know like if some people want to stick to the facts some people don't but then it's like some people just rely on on the endorsements and then don't do the research to be like what truly does this union mean by them backing a certain candidate they don't even know that so it, it was just even a whole whole thing to deal with just within this last election to try to just at least give people the real raw information about looking at facts, looking at productivity, looking at what they value in a candidate and kind of give that to them so they could sit on it and make a decision that they felt good with. Mm-hmm. Yo. That's, and I think that's that. a, huge, a huge part of what we have to, what we have to deal with. Just as um, educating ourselves as citizens, is yeah. the, the work of understanding what a person represents or, or union you know, and so forth. That shit takes time. You got to yes. admit it to do something like that. Yes. And, yeah, I mean, you know, and you got to you get committed. It's no, it's no. There's no easy around that. We don't, um, we we don't get we don't get that that pass. You know what nah. I mean? Our our votes. You know, our our votes as, as black folks. You got to. You got to be educated about what you decide, or who you, or who you decide to vote for, or what you decide to represent. You know, we we really can't be well. You know, I'ma just go ahead and support Trump, or I'ma just go ahead and support Biden, or, or whatever. You got to, you know, we have to make sure that that's the, you know, the the decision we make is is, you know, we got to put some weight behind that and, and hold people's feet to the fire. I never quite understood that when it first it first surfaced after yeah. Floyd, the yeah. whole concept of what defunding the police meant. Mm-hmm. The first thing that, that went to my mind is like, okay, if you defund the police, doesn't mean we don't have any police. And you know, it started like like didn't make any sense to me. And I think that might have been a knee-jerk reaction, you know, to formulate that sort of concept. Um, but reform is definitely needed. Yeah. It's needed not just in one or two places. It's needed, like, right across the board. You know what I'm saying? You know, and I think, you know, if we're going, you know, when you look at everything that is done and the things that are being covered up by police unions, uh, you have to wonder now, well, who is going to be the people in charge of formulating s- such and said reform? You that's know? right. And but that's, that's why I was talking about that's right. review boards and other that's stuff. Right. Yeah. So if, if the unions are so strong, mm-hmm. you know, who is going to make them comply by anything that cool. you, you come up with? The thing is, the police are, they do have they're, they are accountable to people, right? Um, the police are technically accountable to the people that we vote in, mm. our mayors, our city councilmen, right? Um, because that, that's who sets that the salary. Paper? Is that just huh? a paper? Is that just no, no. That, well, that's who sets the salaries. That's who, who allows them. I mean, so on paper, yes, but it's also real because that's who decides how much people are getting paid. Yep. Um, so there's a real, there's a monetary incentive there and we know how that works in America. And you asked a real important question that I don't think we have a, a flushed out answer to because like, let's take the body cam situation. Well, 
uh, cities across the country adopted wearing body cams, but there was no back end, um, you know, accountability on who will review the footage, mm-hmm. where the footage will even be stored, if the footage will even be stored. And they had to alternatively create rules to say that you must have your body camera on and active when you're out there patrolling. Because at first it was like, you gotta wear it, but people weren't turning it on because it wasn't a rule. So there's a lot of, you know, it's the back inside. It's like you said, who, who manages the process? Who's accountable? Because we can do the reform. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we can do all but the reform. I, but I asked the question, the Chad, not because we, I, know, I know we can do the reform. Uh, and and it it's, yeah, that it's necessary, but as you see, as it you know, right now, it doesn't matter what comes down the pike. You know, when you get people, you know, jumping in reporters' face when they have these press conferences, they're going totally against the grain. You know, mm-hmm. they are defending the bad seeds, you know, yeah. and the bad apples. That's what they're doing. So it, it's almost as if the unions now, well, sorry, it's almost as if the police unions have taken on a whole new life unto their own. It's not (laughs) about what unions represent. It's about truly protecting their own, especially (laughs) in the midst of of the wrongs that we see. Yep, It's gang gang out here. Yep, It's it's gang gang, bro. Blood in, blood out. I was waiting for Arbor to jump in. He's going to right now. (laughs) Well, and and again, I'm just I'm just speaking from my personal experience. Um, I I've always felt the police union there for that reason only, and that is to protect the police. Yeah. Um, you know, as a cop and the inside, you learn that, especially as a black cop, that it doesn't necessarily mean it's you, because if protecting you means that it's going against the department, then you're gone. Mm. They're gonna go with the department. Now, Mm. if protecting you is in line with the department, then you're protected. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, does that, is that the same though, Aubrey, if you were a white officer? Well, it is for a white officer. I was only speaking for a white officer because when you're a black (laughs) officer. When you're a black officer, you're subject to whatever goes down. If they feel like you violated oh, you. whatever SOP or whatever law it is, then you violate it. You don't get the same protection that you get. Like, for example, I never joined our union because mm-hmm. I never felt, I, from the very beginning, I felt like the PBA protected the county and not me. You know, so we had a, a smaller police organization that I joined because I feel like they was more aligned with protecting me. And I've seen some of the things that they've done. But, you know, I wasn't joining the PBA because I knew that the loyalty wasn't to me. It's to the county. So wait, wait, talk about that smaller union. What's the, what's the option? I mean, I wasn't even aware that there were other options. I thought it was like... You yeah, know, when I was on the department, union. there was a few options, actually. We had a, um, um, a Black organization that pe- protect the police officers in the county. And then we had a separate organization um, if you did not want to join the PBA. Now, you wasn't required to join any of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't be an officer out there without any coverage. Um, so I elected to join the PBA because, I mean, not join the PBA, PBA because, like I said, I didn't think they represented me whatsoever. Um, of course, um, mm-hmm. I joined the Black organization because that's where our dues went, and I'm going to support them at all costs. But I also joined the, the lateral one as well because mm-hmm. Um, I felt like they had a more effective track record and why not have double representation if I could? Yeah. And, you know, Rashad brought up something last week uh, about the concept of um, having police carry individual insurance policies, hmm. right? Just like doctors do, like how does a malpractice suit? What do you, what do you think about that? Like, cause I think that's a dope idea, you know? Well, I, I think it's, well, here's the thing. Um, I, I, I think that's a ways out. And I only say that because of this. If, if they're not found guilty of anything that they're doing wrong, then there's no need for the policy. The policy is never going to come into play. Right. So first we have to start there. They have to be found guilty and we have to send a message. And it's not even about sending a message. It's just doing what's right and following the law. Mm-hmm. Follow the law across the board. And we wouldn't have any of the issues that we have now. 
And that's where we don't need an insurance policy if we just help people accountable mm -hmm. for their action across the board. True. And so in an ideal the, world, I agree with you. So the cops yeah. using the justification for Blake. Was it Jason? Was his name Jason Blake? Jacob Blake. So. Jacob. Yeah. So Jacob. The, 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 the people representing the officers are saying that because he had a weapon, supposedly, allegedly, um, that after they've and they, they're following him around the car. And obviously to us, he doesn't pose a threat. But their justification, they say, for shooting him is that at some point earlier, it was brought that he had a weapon. So this makes it all well and dally now, as they would have said in Jamaica, for Lego 79 back. <laughs> well, listen, this is what I've heard. And again, um, there, I, as an officer, I've seen several things that sh shouldn't have never happened. Um, if I was made aware from the very beginning that you had a weapon, then I'm not following you. You're stationary until I know you don't have a weapon. You don't get to walk away. I'm not going to hold on to your T-shirt and follow you to your truck where allegedly your weapon is. They, he should have been stopped long before that, long before that. And one, if he has a weapon and you feel like your life is in danger, you haven't even seen the weapon. So there is no justify, you, there is no justification for shooting a man in the back, period, because you're not being threatened. If he had a gun, he was pointing at you, you didn't even see the gun. If, he, if you thought a butt of the gun, from his angle, he couldn't have seen any of that. But it all boils down to this. If you that scared of black people, then don't be a cop. Don't be a cop. But don't see, cop. Just, the justification. You know, if, you, if you're that afraid of people, don't be a cop. If you don't have any type of personal skill, interpersonal skill, don't be a cop. Agreed. I, there were several situations that I've been in much worse than what he'd been in. And I, I didn't shoot anybody. And I certainly didn't shoot anybody in the back. But that's, but see, the justification. It, it, there is no while there is no justification. What's Thank happening you. is is there is a there is a climate right, and this is why the the title of this podcast was the worst cities in America for Black people to live because there is this climate right. There's a climate that allows this man to get shot in the back, and in the same same 24 hour period allows a, a, a young white terrorist to come across lines with a semi-automatic rifle and the police hand him water, mm. right? It's right. a climate that says in certain, in certain areas of America that says that if you're white, no, you're just doing the right thing. You're a law-abiding citizen, even when you are obviously are doing questionable stuff. Right. There's right? always an excuse for white people and we don't There's have always. the luxury of those excuses. Right. They always get the benefit question. of right. the doubt. And <laughs> I've seen that across the board from corporate America. I've been in corporate America for almost 20 years. From every facet of corporate America I've been in, the white people always get the benefit of the doubt. When it comes down to the black person, regardless if it's the same scenario, I'm finding that they always start at 10 and work their way down. When it's a white person, they start at one and go up. You know white is right. That's why that's why we asked that question though, right? Where where do we live? Yeah, um, because if, uh, he, if Aubrey, he was in and, go ahead, Rashad. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, Aubrey, in your, your situations that you've had to nav navigate the uh, was it in the back of your mind that in uh, being a black law enforcement officer? If anything happens, it can go way differently for you than one of your white counterparts. Okay, you're breaking up, but so let me paraphrase if I heard you correctly. You're saying in the situations yeah. that I was in, was it in the back of my mind that it would go down differently if I was it was a white counterpart? Yeah, you were, if you were white. Like if something went wrong. Like if something went wrong, was you did you have it in the back of your mind? You know, they're not going to give me the leverage that they want one of these white police officers. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would, and I would say that the, you don't ever stop being black. And that's just the reality. I don't care what facet of 
career you worked in, you don't stop being black. And we had the standard joke and on the department is, don't be a training video. And meaning that what you do as a black officer, they're gonna use that in a training room in the academy on what not to do because you're gonna go to jail. But the white police officer can do the exact same thing and you see them skate time and time and time again. So we always say, bruh, you about to be a training video, so you better watch what you're doing. Wow. So it's always in the back of your mind. It's you, you already know you're going to be second guessed from the time you start to the time you finish. That's why I suggested, um, it's a long way off, suggest insurance. Because uh, what, what tends to happen is, all right, so these folks get they shot, right? Um, the police walk. So that's that's criminal. But on the civil end, the city pays up. So guess who pays? It's the taxpayers. So we're basically, as taxpayers, we end up underwriting the tax or ensuring the cost of these, these, these misdeeds. Whereas if that burden were placed in um, an insurance perspective, as, as say union or whoever paying a group professional insurance, then that burden of uh, 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 professional malfeasance runs through an insurance policy and they have to pay that burden as opposed to the citizens being accountable for the cost or, 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 or the, um, the, 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 the misdeeds of the officers. Well, the, the, I mean, but the re- <laughs> I, my question would be, who's mm-hmm. gonna insure them with that type of liability <laughs> and and how would you mandate that they carry it? That's my um, the 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 well. There's people that will insure it. The cost of insurance, though, would be ridiculous. The point is the liability, where and where that liability stems from, right? So, so when we have negligent situations like this, because but military insurance, we get life insurance like that or what have you but the if we could do it would basically put a focus on the liability and how that liability comes about so it would force it i think it would force uh more organizational restructuring to lower the cost of the liability i'm gonna say this where the money go the law is gonna follow that's that's so that so, that's what i'm saying so this it's could a money, be this, it's a money yeah, play basically this could be one of those situations where where you know because because laws are always in america our laws tend to be retroactive anyway they're always playing catch up right. you know so between things like a, a a citizen review board with subpoena power between uh reorganizing um police unions right uh between adding in insurance requirements for individual officers um, I think we'd be a long way to reform. I mean, we still have to, we still haven't talked about the training requirements and continuous right. training, right? For the individual officers. But, um, I talk about that. you know, <laughs> yeah, right? I, I, mean, but, I, I hear that all the time about training. And my thing is this I'm like, why, if you have to, <laughs> if you got to train somebody not to kill black people, then you should be a cop. You picked the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm like, what, what, what training do I need to tell you the man in the back? What training do I need to tell you don't put your knee on the back of a man next? I mean, if, if they can't breathe, what training do I need to tell you? Check and see if he can breathe. I mean, there's no, that's common sense. And if, and if it's not common sense, then you shouldn't hire that person. So it's not about training. It's about picking people who qualify to do the job. And I can tell you right now, even when I was on the department, I felt like most of the officers that was coming through were just people who wanted to have a badge. They didn't believe in law enforcement. Um, They wanted the power and the prestige that came with it. And in my opinion, a lot of them should have never made it out of the academy. We was literally in the academy saying, we already know in three years, he's gonna be on internal affairs. We was in the academy saying that this person is not gonna make it. We already know where he's going to be. So when you hear somebody, when we was heard someone say, well, you know, Raph was involved in so-and-so, he's at a tournament. I'm like, man, we saw this in the academy. 
I don't know how they, you know, no one else picked it up when they was going through his records, but this is not new to us. It didn't show up on the psychology profile. <laughs> I'm like, it's not new to us. I'm like, we saw this. And if we saw it, then how do you tell me the training advisor in the academy didn't see it? I you know, said that's just as long as they were. I just want to know, you know, why, the, tra- why the training ain't like it is on the, in the movies. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> why is it not I, I like in the movies? <laughs> you know, they seem to be quite prepared and ready for everything, but the, everything that we see now is like they seem like officers are woefully underprepared. You know, can't, don't don't. You know, I guess you know. You know, nobody's really want to do. You know, you know, you know, hand to hand combat. You know, but geez, you know, I see officers running away from people. You know, um, you know, and 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 everything. And you're just like, but you're the one with the gun. You know, you know, and 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 you you when you see they're doing stops for for white folks and stuff like that, and white folks are acting crazy, and they manage. To not get, you know, as uh, as 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 our esteemed leader said, they they um, what did he say today? Yesterday? Um, too- no, I'm sorry. Yeah, with the, with the whole golf thing, they um, what did he say? You know, they um, you know, where, where you 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 have, I guess you have a brain fart and you 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 get stuck. You make a mistake. You know, how do you make a mistake? You know, and and shoot somebody. You know, was a mulligan back. You know, right? Exactly. And and that. How does that? How does that happen? It it, it, it should never happen. Right. And and yes, and and if it does happen, you should get to go home when it does. Mm -hmm. Because it happened today, we excuse it. What happened when it happens tomorrow? And on Friday, and it and it will and on happen Sunday. Or, or Friday or next week or next right. month. Right. So I'm like, no, the lesson should be told. I'm like, you know, some mistakes you don't get to do twice. Right. Um, I have a question for you, Aubrey. Um, how do you feel about police officers patrolling the community that when they have to actually get out the car and get involved and get to know the community? Do you think that it's was- called community policing? It's called yeah. community policing. And when I was in the department, we had a community policing squad. And I think that's the difference because I work north side, I work Liberty City. Um, and I think the difference is, is that it's clear that the officers have lost control of the streets. It's mm-hmm. clear. No one respects them. And it was a different level of respect when I was on the department. I was on the department from 95 to 2001. Um, and and if you ever been in Northside now, Liberty City, it's a completely different area because the projects that they had there when I was there, they're no longer projects. Um, so it's a different level. But the difference is community policing is when you can go into a neighborhood, for example, you get a lot, you get a loud music call because we used to have the jams. I don't know if y'all familiar with Miami, where you have wall-to-wall speakers, about 15 speakers, and it's literally shaking six blocks. Okay. And someone in the neighborhood will call the police because they don't have no permits and we know that when we got there, but everybody's out there having a good time, okay? As a police officer, it's your job to go shut it down because they don't have the permit and you receive a number of complaints. This is where community policing come in. I, as an officer, can go up in there with 75 to 150 people outside having a good time, walk up to the DJ, tell the DJ, look, bro, we got several complaints. You got a permit? No, I don't have a permit. Okay, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to let you get five more songs, and then we got to shut it down. Mm-hmm. I'm going to wait here until you shut it down and pack it up. I say, so let the people know we're going to close it down, but we're going to ride out five more times. And I said, the last song, you got to give me a shout out. That's the difference. That's, That's the difference what's up. between <laughs> someone who rolls up in there with three other cops and get up there and start telling you need to shut this down, just being disrespectful, cursing, you know, calling them out in the names. Black people are only going to take so much, yeah. especially in the city. You're not going to talk to me any kind of way. So now that plain simple, hey, we're going to need you to shut this down. You don't have a permit. You coming in and being disrespectful. Now the crowd don't turn against you. Now you calling for backup. Now the whole department, the whole city is running to your rescue. 
because you walked in because you have a badge and you think that badge is going to protect you. The badge only, it don't mean anything if they don't respect it. Respect it. That's it. And people right. don't respect That's people it. who are disrespectful. Mm. Period. Exactly. Exactly. Now, my, my, okay, now with that being said, what do you think? And this, I know this is only your opinion. Police officers can do to earn that respect back in the community. Let's go. Well, I think you have to start back with community. Well, I think community police should have never left the community. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts with literally being in the community. You're going to have to get a squad together um, mm -hmm. that you trust, um, that has the interpersonal skills, um, that has the life skills, that represents the community and what you're taking them into, okay, who live probably lived in that community. And then you start with that squad and you have them being a notable force that they see out there. People need someone to call. When they don't want to call the police, but they need to call the police, they're going to call community police. Because I know Officer Rogers. Officer Rogers went to school with my mama. Mm. Okay, Officer Rogers was hanging down the street with my grandma. So I'm going to call Officer Rogers and let him know, listen, man, Officer Kemp was over here yesterday. He was disrespectful. Let me tell you what he did. So now Officer Rogers' responsibility is like, hey, man, Sarge, I'm telling you what's going on with Kemp. You know, this is what's a word on the street. You know, somebody need to pay a little more attention to it. But you have to start with that one squad who's going to be out there, who's going to be the face. And then once you get that squad out there, you bring people onto that squad. And then eventually you're going to have several squads out there. That's how you get the community back behind them. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, just being 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 part of the as opposed to coming from the outside in. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, well, you know, they, they, they like to paint us as out as being disrespectful and hard to talk to and difficult to work with. No, we just want to be treated with respect. Mm -hmm. If you treat people with respect, they show you respect. And the moment you lose that, it's all downhill. You know, I'm the most respectful person you can find, but when you disrespect me, you get a whole different side. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. You know, I meet you where I meet you. You come Big with facts. me with respect. I mean, listen, you come with me with respect, we handle it respectfully the whole time. But the moment you step outside that line, I'm gonna give you one opportunity to clear it up. And then the second time, I'm like, bro, we got a whole different issue. Yeah. And I think so many times we have officers who think, we call it the heavy bad syndrome. You know, mm. you, th you think that badge protects you because it's a badge on your chest. But until you out in the street and somebody rip it off, and let me tell you, <laughs> I was out there and had somebody rip mine off my chest. Yeah. Okay. They tell you, quit. This badge don't mean nothing to me. It literally, that's what he said. Now what? <laughs> it means nothing to me. Ripped it off, and now we rolling on the ground. Mm. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> these guess people what? Like, these Look, people like guess that. guess what? You yeah. are that one time. You're like, okay, I get it. You get one I time. Get mm -hmm. I get it. I respect that. Watch what you say when you talk to this man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the advent now that you know they're pushing this whole law and order, uh, uh, law and order and fear. So it's a law and order and fear. So at which point? In the near, in the foreseeable future, whether it's near or way down the line, that community policing or the community will ever respect our community will ever respect the police. Well, I don't think mm. we're that far off, you know, because I still think we got great officers out there, and I know we got great black officers out there, and mm. you know, I come from a law enforcement family. You know, my brother's just retired, did 27 years. You know, um, you know, my sister-in-law, you know, I got cousins. You know, we come from a law enforcement family. So, and I got tons and tons of friends who's still on the apartment, you know, over 25 years later. There's still great officers out there who still has a rapport with the community. You know, we just need to put more of them out there. And I'm not telling you that all of them need to look like us. Um, they just need to have the same mindset mm -hmm. and understand the community in which you patrol and you serve. So and if we're able to, if we're able to have more of those officers 
in leadership role and command roles? Because do you think that would make a bigger difference? Because depending on who is up in charge is setting the pace of who gets promoted into, into, into different aspects of policing. Well, I think it go hands in hand. I think it go hand in hand because guess what? We knew as an officer, we know that we, we knew the corrupt officers, we knew the corrupt sergeants, we knew the corrupt lieutenants, we knew the corrupt captain. Okay, we knew that, listen, bruh, that so and so squad, you ain't gonna never make it to that squad because he already know he don't like black people. Mm, okay. We knew that. We knew that. It was no secret. Okay. The same thing when you hear when you hear something on the radio saying, you know, or an officer calling for a backup and they screaming like little girls, you think, okay, I know what happened because he don't know how to talk to people. That's why he's, that's why you on the radio call. You said your man on the radio screaming like a little girl. <laughs> that's exactly what I, I see. Think- Maybe he wanted to phrase it a different way. No, that's exactly what I said. Call, call it like you see it. Listen, call, when you, call it like you please. see it. Help. When you, listen, Help. when you hear it, you're, you're looking at the radio saying, really? So now I have to go in and put my life in danger because we already know he had no interpersonal skill. And when we heard the call, you already know to start headed to that area. Because about three seconds later, he's being going to be on the radio because you said the wrong thing and you're afraid of people and you have no interpersonal skill. And, and, and I feel that's a problem with a lot of police officers on the force nowadays that they don't know how to talk to people. And when they when they get that comeback, they get afraid. Yeah. Right. And because it's like it's Aubrey said. Thing. Go ahead, Aubrey. Go ahead, I was saying like it's like um, like you said, if if you're scared. You don't need to be doing this job. Mm-hmm. Pretty Point much. blank. Yes, Pretty much. Right. And if you can't talk to people, then you don't need to be doing this job, especially Black people, because we have a history of being talked to, demeanored, abused, pushed around, disrespected. And I can tell you, as a Black man, enough is enough. <laughs> it's enough. I stand up. I take care of my family. I work hard. I'm a productive part of the society. You're not going to talk to me any kind of way. Mm-hmm. And I expect for me to say, yes, sir, and do everything that you asked me to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I avoid cops at all costs, especially when they don't look like me. Because I already have my mindset. As a cop. <laughs> as, as a former law enforcement. Let me tell you this story. I got pulled over as a cop. Um. When I was working in the department, I was literally, I was on my way to return a rental car on 95 South, going to downtown Miami to return a rental car. I was in my rental car. I had a friend of mine following me behind me in his car, who was also a cop. Got pulled over by FHP. Okay. I'm like, listen, nine times out of 10, I never revealed that I was a cop. Most people say I'm a cop. Hey, bro, let's get some professional courtesy. I did not. I didn't even want to go through it. Write me the ticket. I take the ticket. I just want to go. Least minimum interaction is possible. Okay. It went so left so quick where I identified myself as an officer. I'm saying, listen, bro, this is going way too far left. And he wasn't a brother. Um, he was white. Um, and I identified myself as an officer. I showed this man every piece of Law enforcement, law enforcement identification I had. Mm. Do you know he literally still called to the station, the precinct in which I worked, and asked them to describe what I looked like? Yes. Wow. Yes. It, was not enough. Cost, it wasn't not oh, enough. Yes. You're looking at my ID. The, the you called the precinct to see if someone knew me so they can describe what I looked like. Yes. Wow. To verify you, got to got right. to check you because I cannot be an officer. There's no way possible. Oh, the mayo is thick on that one, sir. <laughs> that's like that's like the um the 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 video that was shown on social media recently of the cat. Forget where I don't know if you, I don't think it was. It might have been here in Florida. I remember. No, I don't think it was in Florida, the but he was in that type of a restaurant. No, this was he was he was this cat was in his house. Oh, okay. In his yard, and he was in the front of the yard, and he walked to the side of the yard, and Damn. 
the cops came, the cop came and was asking him do you know for his id and he was like why you need my id you know he's like you know i i you know i i i know you know he didn't reveal immediately that he lived there he said you know i just stay here and the cop was well you know you need to show me id so you know he was basically having to prove right the house that he lived in very nice house in a very nice neighborhood mm -hmm. that he actually belonged in that neighborhood and is able to live in that house. And as the, the him, so officer you, gave was yeah. that he seen him walking along the side of the house. Yes, you say, I saw you walking along the side of the house. Right. It's my like, house, I can do right. that. Right, do right. That. so the guy said, so if you pull up and you see on my neighbor walking along the side of the house, are you gonna go over there and ask him for his ID? But because, you know, he was black and he lived in a nice house, mm -hmm. he, just, he didn't belong there, you mm -hmm. know? Where so we we I see we we're, we're always in this perpetual stage of continually to prove yeah. our existence and our being, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And why should that be? You know, we like we are we are still regarded as non-citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you're a citizen doesn't mean you belong here. Right. You know, this is what they, everybody they, you know trying to tell us. You know. Yeah, you're a citizen, but you don't belong here. And more importantly, no matter how far we climb, we're not supposed to be there. Right. It's infallible that we can do this in their eyes. Right. It's, it's just not possible. It, not it's, possible. Dis, uh, it's disrespectful. It means it's, how dare you want more? <laughs> how dare you expect to 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 best? You know, it's 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 amazing a lot of time. So, do you think yeah. so? You know, you know, Aubrey. You know, when it comes to you know training and and um, you know what what you think they need to do. Does mm -hmm. does everything cross the board? What do you think they need to do in ter in in light of what we see now? Um, you know, and what they're 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 conjuring up, you know, to stoke all kind of fear and stuff in people. What is it that that needs to be done? Well, I, I think you need to start at the top, and I think you need to remove <clears throat> you need to remove the stereotype. Well, it's not a stereotype. You need to remove the notion that it's okay. Mm -hmm. That it's okay. And once you remove the notion that it's okay, then now people who are normally not willing to step in and say, hey, I'm going to help you out to fix this because I see you guys need help. They're not as willing to help when they realize that I'm going to work this hard and put in all this effort, and then you guys are not going to do anything about it when I bring you stuff that needs to be handled. So you have to yeah. start at the top and say, listen, when we bring you this, it needs to be handled accordingly. You don't sleep it under the rug. I'm not bringing you this because this is something that I think. I'm bringing you something because you need to nip it in the bud and remove it. Yeah. It's just as simple. Cut it out. So until yeah. we do that, you know, we have a long way to go. And the and the and the mindset is there's a situation. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I ultimately left the department because I felt that I did not have any representation. Um, I was involved in a situation where a use of force complaint was sustained against me, an excessive use of force. Um, me and my partner went to a call and I'm gonna make the story short so I can go back to my point. Um, me and my partner went to a call. The call went out as a emergency call where the son was beating up the wife and the mother and punching holes in the wall. I get there, me and my partner, who's a Hispanic male, uh, we was in academy together. Um, I get there with me and my partner. We, first thing we do, we separate the two parties. Um, he's inside with the wife and her daughter. They're African-American. I'm outside with the young man who's supposed to be the subject in the investigation. He's African-American. We're separating. I'm walking him towards the gate. Excuse me. He has the other party inside of the house. As I'm walking him towards the gate and I'm walking behind him, I'm probably about, maybe about three to four steps behind him. Um, 
the girlfriend runs out the door. She says something to him, and he immediately turns. And when he turns, he's literally within striking distance from me because I'm still walking. I ain't expecting to turn. And he turns so quick. The first thing I thought to myself, create distance. That's what they tell us in the academy. If you're in arm reaches of a subject, you're too close. Create distance. So the first thing I did was I pushed him. When I pushed him, he lost his balance. He fell. And he fell into my police car. And his elbow hit the police window and shattered the window. That right there is a use of force. So now everything stops. We have to call the sergeant out there. They got to take reports. They got to take pictures. All of this stuff needs to come out. Of course, got to call for a rescue, see if you need any treatment. Sergeant comes out. Actually, he wasn't a sergeant. He was my corporal at the time. Corporal comes out, and corporal takes all the statements. The young man says to the corporal, the officer thought that I was going to hit him. That's why he pushed me. Oh, wow. This is what he says to the corporal. Corporal write it down. It's all in the notes. It's all in the paperwork. Okay, goes to Internal Affairs. Um, I have to go to Internal Affairs. My partner had to go to Internal Affairs. It's all inside of the note. The corporal who goes to Internal Affairs says that the office, the, the young man told him that. The young man comes to Corporal Affair, Internal Affairs and said, this is what I told them. It was the mother who filed the Internal Affairs complaint. Okay, so the young man didn't even file the complaint. It was the mother who filed the complaint. Long story short, <laughs> They sustained that complaint, excessive use of force. So now that means I either take that as a, a write-up and have it on my record forever, or I can fight it. If I fight it, that means I'm suspended. I'm suspended. I have no job, no pay, no police uniform, no badge. If I got a county gun, that goes back. I have nothing with the county on, OK? So, but that was the only way that I can fight it is to take the suspension and then fight the suspension. So I did that. We fought that for a year and a half, all the way up to arbitration. Nine people signed off on this. Those are your checks and balances. Nine people signed off on this. We got the arbitration. Who pays for arbitration and the attorney and all those people to come through? We do. Mm -hmm. The county. The people who work and pay their taxes. This man finished arbitration after he spoke to everybody in the group. Yeah, everybody's statement. He was out 15 minutes when he came back and said this should have never happened. Mm -hmm. We should have never got this far. I got completely clear. But what that showed me was I had no covering mm -hmm. on that department. Nothing. Nine people had to sign off. This could have been stopped at any time. It wasn't. And then I realized that. Why would I risk my life on the apartment? It's one thing to have to watch your back on the streets. It's yeah. another thing to have to watch your back in the department that you're fighting for. Hmm. And I wasn't worthy to do it anymore. That's crazy, bro. Wow. That's, wow. that's, that's a lot, man. You're right. You're right. It's like you can't fight two battles, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, so, so to go back to the question is, it has to start at the top. The checks and balances need to be just that. They need to be checked and they need to be balanced. If it's bull, throw it out. And we need somebody there who's just not signing reports and passing them on to the next person. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it has to, everyone has to, you need to be people, people there who are not afraid to be accountable. People who are not just waiting out their time on the department so they can go to retirement and get their drop money. You know, you need people who are going to work the eight hours that they're there to work mm -hmm. and work efficiently and lawfully and accurately. If no. not, everything else down is not going to work. So I have a state, uh, just a quick statement. I, I feel, I feel oh, that for sure. back to your, your whole respect and disrespect. And I think if as a people, we were made to feel that we were or are being respected especially when it comes to policing, I think you would have more cooperation from residents and citizens in communities mm -hmm. to be able to make those communities better and safer. But because we don't get that respect, I think most people are to the point where, well, we don't care. You know, um, we're going to try to exist, you know, the way we exist now. And, 
you know, deal with whatever comes in, the, you know, the crime and, and all that good stuff, you know. But I, think- I, I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't say that we don't care because I think everyone want to live in a safe environment. Everyone yeah. want their properties to go up, you know, a, a, everyone. But I think they've been beating down so much where they're numb. And we need to let them know it's okay to feel again because not only is it okay to feel, we need you to feel so that we can make these things right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yo, you, you were dropping, brother. You you gave us knowledge. I mean, that's why I think everybody was so quiet because we were just listening gross. Um, but we are coming to that stage in the program where is, we get these topics where there's so much to cover, right? Um, but we only have a set amount of time and we're, we're in our last 10 minutes. So we've got to actually wrap up. And during this time, we give everybody a chance to review and give last thoughts um, to kind of, you know, say something you didn't say or just repeat something you think everybody needs to hear. These are our best soundbite moments. Um, so what we're going to do is we will come back and we will do a part two because unpacking this, this is deep. And y'all are, yo, like, I mean, thank you so much to you and to Brenda, like so much knowledge and just good passion has been shared tonight, but we got to wrap it up. So we are going to start to wrap up. I won't start it with the guest, <laughs> right? I won't put y'all on the spot to start. We'll start to wrap up with our, with our regulars that are here. Um, and then we will come back to you. We'll, we'll finish on you guys. Is that fair guess? Is Yeah, that's cool. Okay. So uh, between Rashad and Irie, who's taking the first leg of the wrap up? Oh, I'm going to beat them to the punch. I'm going to do it first. Oh, let's go. <laughs> what? No pen, That's, a first. <laughs> That's a real first. Yeah, well, you know, I'm going to be short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to, to thank the guests for coming on this week. Uh, they they gave us some, 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 some positive ideas, dropped some knowledge, and we need to work um, together to like how how uh, they were saying to form these committees to start the reform for the police department. We need we need the um the the police in the communities. We need to, to establish these boards and and just get it together. And then, and once we do that, I feel the community will be a whole lot safer. Cause and then maybe we can get us an officer friendly again. Mm-hmm. That's all I have to say. Officer Peter J. Friendly. <laughs> All right, fellas, don't be shy. We know neither one of y'all got that trait. Yeah, Rashad. Yeah. Rashad. Um, <laughs> no, no, um, it's 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 just it's been it's been a conversation. My my thing is say the same to uh, what everybody else has been saying, just working working uh, more within the community. And it comes down to respect, you know. A, a culture of respect when folks feel like they can respect you, you know, not because they feel some type of way, but because it's been enforced. I mean, let's let's be real, man. We live in America. This this place is built on racism. It's built on hate. And it's built on people coming from being hated to go hate somebody else. You know what I mean? Until we change that that concept and dynamic, we're gonna have these issues. You know, that's that's all it is. Okay, so, I have so, thing what? To you're done. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. You know what it is. Too. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm done. I mean, they, I ain't got anything <laughs> else done. to say about that. That you is know what it, it is. What it is. You... <laughs> I'm gonna add one more thing to what I had to say. Um, the badge does not get you respect. So if you believe that, that right. the badge gets you respect, no, your actions and your deeds. That's where the respect comes from. Exactly. For real, for real. real. Rashad, bro, listen, man, you having Teddy Riley moments tonight, man. So (laughs) the next week. (laughs) Okay, I thought it was just me, man. I'm like, okay. That's what it is. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you still having Teddy Riley moments right now. I just, for next week, I need you to be, because, you know, I appreciate what you say. Your words are valued, and this has been the briefest that you've ever been. It's okay. <laughs> well, I, I, there, there's not much left to be said, so I don't have to say much. Uh, so. Her death, <laughs> death, shoot. Well, I got to say, I don't know. 
Well, you know, over the years, you know, being here in this country, you know, I've been stopped many times. And there's some of those times, you know, I could, things could have gone differently for me in terms of, you know, you know, being incarcerated for riding dirty, you know, blah, blah, you know, no insurance, suspended license, you know, unknowingly, or, you know, you find you, you try to, you know, I didn't, you act a fool, whatever. But thankfully for me, the people who stopped me and almost all, every time that I was stopped, it was not, it was never a black, a black officer. And for the times that, you know, they could have made the choice uh, to say, you know what, we're going to incarcerate, you know, you know, impound you, write you a whole bunch of tickets, send you to jail, you know, let you work it out on your own. They didn't do that. They made a different choice. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, you know, I feel for the people who go through scenarios and situations where that's not the case. You know, whether it's just as simple as, you know, being incarcerated and unfortunate for people who have lost their lives. You know, but I think, you know, this thing that we're seeing now, um, barring just what happening in, in unions and the behavior of cops and, you know, just all across, all across the board, it's been exacerbated by the rhetoric that's coming directly from the top, mm. you know, and that is what, like you said, need, you know, that's the, one of the biggest things that needs to change. You know, how does, as you say, words have power, words got meaning, you know, and if, you know, the words that are coming from the top have the power but have no meaning, you know, it does seem as if we're going to be caught on this freaking, this loop. This loop, yeah. You know, we're going to be on this loop continuously, you know, because we're always going to be asking for change. We're looking for people who are supposed to provide, help provide that change and half shit, three quarters of them people, you know, don't want to make those, the change happen. You know, so we, you know, 40 years ago, we were saying one thing, 40 years today, we're still saying the same thing. And if none of that happens 40 years from now, we're going to be still saying the same thing, you know, and that, that can't happen, you know, um, it, it it just it just shouldn't and it just can't. Wow. Yeah, yeah, for real, for real, for real. This is why we call him Mr. Wisdom, y'all. Uh he's he be dropping that thing. Um uh, uh, Chad, Chad, I yeah. got a question. Mm -hmm. Um, this go to Irie and Rashad. Y'all switch places. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this week we are we are not, not a monolith. Okay? Yeah. We are not a monolith, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we had a meeting. <laughs> we had our own meeting. That's right. That's right. I mean, we had our own meeting. <laughs> All right, y'all. Listen, y'all just keeping us on our toes. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Keeping us fresh, making sure we paying attention. That's fine. That's fine. We are. Um, yeah, so so uh, uh, family for our guest, um, I think it's right if we let our queen close it out. So Aubrey, man, I'm I'm a I'm gonna call you up to the podium next. I'm gonna ask you to step on up to the congregation, so <laughs> and uh, well, bless us. Well, first I want to say it was certainly a pleasure being with you, kings and queen tonight. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think that this needs to happen more often, um, but. More importantly, I want to say that um, police reform is absolutely necessary. Uh, police reform isn't about great officers because we know there are tons of them out there. It's about the bad seeds. And, uh, and hopefully those great officers who are out there who's holding the line and doing what they're supposed to do day in and day out and taking the risk and protecting our streets and our family they understand that when we talk about issues such as this, we're not talking about you. We're talking about the ones that are making your job that much harder. That part, that, that's, yeah. All right, Aubrey, Aubrey, man, you're killing it. Um, Brenda, it, it's 
tough, some tough acts to follow, but I know you got this. I have faith in you. I believe. Oh, man. Well, I just want to thank y'all for including me, including my voice on this. It's been real good um, kind of hearing the dialogue between y'all. It's some stuff that I'm not always privy to um, that sometimes I just need to sit back and hear it. Um, you know, just as a time where, you know, Black women are always feeling like we are always on the front lines, but it's always cool to even just have the support of just being a listening ear um, to what the brothers have to say. So I've definitely enjoyed my time here. And I just even want to add on our Aubrey's uh, wisdoms that he dropped. Um, one of the things I, I also want to see be changed in addition to even starting at the top is also uh, stopping the practice of um, retaliatory acts for those good cops that want to speak out. You know, it it kind of hurt just to kind of even see what occurred um, with the uh, with the protest down at the Fort Lauderdale protest, where it's like people saw the picture, the infamous picture that was taken with with like the officer, I think her name was Crystal, um, point her finger at the bad cop. And it's like people, it, it was even a notion put in place to say, yo, like don't put a name out there because we don't want any retaliatory acts being put against her um, when she's just really doing what she's supposed to be doing, which is calling out the bad stuff. And so I think that's definitely a, a needed thing in, in addition to also kind of calling out what's being done at the top. Yo, that, that is a needed addition to this conversation. And yeah. we're going to have to dive into that next week. You know, um, it's funny because I'm listening to all y'all and I feel kind of like Smokey and Friday, right? <laughs> uh, no, 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 that's Smokey. <laughs> like Ezel, like Ezel. When Ezel looked at Smokey, he said, Smokey. Now, I ain't the brightest man in the world, but it looks <laughs> like from here, you know, I know we are not Rhodes Scholars or yeah. Nobel Prize winners, but we have just outlined. And when I say we, I'm talking about everybody in this group. We've outlined some real concrete steps, right? Like if we had to give a report in deliverables and say, hey, this is the minimum things that you could do for police reform and for community reform. I think we have really had some real concrete stuff come out of this conversation. And it made me think of my role as a professional and the fact that I'm always trying to be better, right? And a part of me being better is wanting my industry, wanting the young people coming up behind me for them to be better than I was and to grow in a different culture I was. And this is inside of my career. So when I think about what you were just saying about the good cops, right? And that's you, Brenda, and that's Aubrey, and that's Rashad, and that's Ira. When I When I think about them, I think the change has to come from within, right? If you're a good cop, I don't have to say, oh, this doesn't include you when we're talking about reform because you know what you do. Right. But as a good cop, I feel like you should also have that desire to always grow and better yourself and to leave a legacy of a better culture and a better thing. So I think I wanna add to this conversation that we need more change coming from within. Mm -hmm. We need more of an internal push as well to build on. Um, and that's, that's my contribution to the conversation because I think it's important. Um, but I'll close this out. And then, you know, we always talk for a little bit after. But I just want to thank everybody that's watching on, on Facebook, whether you're on Twitter, whether you're on YouTube, whether you're on Twitch. Uh, we're streaming live on about four platforms. We got a total of 15 followers, but that's okay. Um, that's 15 strong. Um, this has been another episode. We love those 15. We ride. <laughs> right? um, you know, this has been another episode of The Bridge. And this is Barbershop Talk. Earlier today, I hashtagged the King Talk. What we're doing is we're having some tough, some uncomfortable conversations. We try to inject some humor, but we're putting a lot of real life lessons. And the purpose is to literally be a, a education point, right? Um, if we bring someone on this podcast, and matter of fact, our regulars on this podcast, we are all super accomplished. We are so accomplished, in fact, that we have achieved echo chamber status when it comes to, you know, our social media feeds and our other stuff. And we realized that there needed to be a platform where we could take what we take for granted, I would say, because it's in our circles every day and put that information out. Whether you hear these episodes today or whether you hear them, you know, uh, a month or two from now, we hope that you can dig some importance and some meaning and some relevance to your life. And we hope that it resonates in a way that brings you 
home and allows you to take this information and share it because that's what it is. It's information that is meant to move a community. And that's what ideas do. Ideas are viral. And that's what it's about. When we say it's the bridge, we're here for you every weekday. Oh, well, not every weekday. I mean, we're going to have enough episodes soon that we could just play one every weekday. But we're here every Tuesday, 9 p.m. with other interesting topics. And it's all about being Black. Black life in America um, is king talk. But we always got our queens on. So join us next Tuesday. We'll see you then. Um, fellas, that's our official sign-off. So now we can wrap it up. If y'all want to have bridge. more time, go. It's the bridge. <laughs>